introduce to you Natalie Kogan. You can see her beautiful smiling little face over there with all the wonderful artwork and she's the founder of Happier Inc., creator of the Happier Method and author of Happier Now. I've attended several of her webinars and we recently shared her Happier Workout with our team during our uh, breakfast meeting last month and um, we definitely love her gratitude and intentional kindness practices and we've incorporated some of the different things um, that we learned throughout um, the uh, video that we watched and incorporated that into some of the normal things that we do throughout Therapy Travelers. So we are super happy to have Natalie here today to talk about emotional health at work during challenge and uncertainty. And with that being said, I'd love to turn the call over to you and feel free to share your introduction. And um, thank you for joining us today. Welcome, Natalie. Well, thank you so much. Thank you um, for making time, everyone. I can only imagine what your to-do lists are like, so I'm so grateful you're here to make some time for your well-being today. Um, I have a request. Uh, my request is very simple. Uh, if you can, please turn on your camera. I don't care what your hair looks like. I do not care if you're having lunch. I don't care if your kids are sitting next to you or on top of you. I don't care if your pets are in the picture, and I don't care if you're looking at me the whole time. But this way I get to talk to human beings instead of myself or my screen. I love all of you turning on your cameras and your smiles. Thank you. I don't care if you get up and come back. The only, the, only, the only request is if you eat something yummy that you share it with me. That's my only request. <laughs> but see, this way we actually get to like connect this way. Love it. Thank you all so much. What a great group. I love that. You're welcome. Um, I really, really do appreciate it. It just helps me. It helps us connect as humans, even though we're not in the same space. Um, and all of you look absolutely fabulous. I just have to say, Com perfection, beauty. Thank you all. Um, so, uh, ooh, where to begin? Um, you know, when this uh, pandemic uh, broke out um, several weeks ago, years ago, months ago, I don't know, time has gotten very, very fluid these days, right? It just seems like a long time ago. Um, something that, um, that I made a commitment to do. And my colleague, Debbie, who's also here with us, she's gonna facilitate Q&A at the end, which I should say, we will do Q&A at the end. So if you have questions as I'm talking, please feel free to just put them in chat. Um, I love seeing people's kids. This makes me so happy. Um, so if you have questions as I'm talking, please put them in chat and Debbie will help us facilitate. We'll definitely take time for questions. So when this all began, one of the things um, I said to myself was uh, the world feels so out of control and there are so, so many things that are difficult. What is something that I can do to help me get through this? And part of my answer was, well, I can serve my bigger why. And my bigger why is to help awesome humans like you with some skills and practices to help you get through this challenging time. So um, with that, I just want to start with my gratitude for having an opportunity to share some of that with you because that's, that's what's getting me through this difficult time. So um, since you guys have already been familiar, already are familiar with some of the happier skills, I love knowing that. Um, I thought today we would focus on um, uh, acceptance and self-compassion. Um, and I'm gonna share some context and some science and a little bit of my own story and some practical um, little practices for you to take away so you can help yourself manage some of the stress you're all feeling um, and just move through your days with a little bit more ease. And then we'll do questions. So that's, that's our plan. Um, I want to start with, well, I want to start with a couple things. One is um, I'm also going to probably touch on just a little bit um, on something I wasn't planning on, but uh, given everything that is going on in addition to the virus, um, everything that is going on um, with all the anti-racism protests and just the pain that uh, so many of our black friends and colleagues are feeling. Something I've been talking a lot about this week is how we can be powerful sources of support for our black colleagues and friends. So I am going to touch on that. I just want to share that I wasn't planning on it, but I couldn't do a talk this week without talking about that. And it actually has to do with acceptance. Um, but I want to start uh, just by sharing a little bit of context just to help you, because it's really helped me understand um, why this time may feel so overwhelming. Uh, some of it is obvious, right? We are amidst a worldwide pandemic. Many of us have been on lockdown. We are juggling so much. My 16 year old daughter is over there in her room. Um, she's missed three months of school. 
Some of us have smaller kids. Some of us are stuck at home and feeling lonely. We're all experiencing so much um, loss, even like loss of routine or normalcy or you know, being able to leave our house. I usually spend about 50% of my time on the road giving talks and speeches and I've been home the whole time. Um, and we're also, uh, so there's just some obvious really difficult challenges and many of us are really worried about the health of our loved ones, maybe people losing jobs. But in addition to that, there's something else going on that I just wanna shine some light on to give you um, just more of a perspective of for why you may be feeling more overwhelmed or more stressed or more exhausted. And it has to do with uncertainty. Um, you know, to do my work, I spent a lot of time doing neuroscience research, psychology research, and it turns out that uncertainty is the hardest thing for the human brain to deal with. Um, you know, I run a company called Happier, but I get on these stages and I say, you know, your brain's number one job is not to make you happy. It's to protect you. That's your brain's number one job. And to do that, your brain is constantly evaluating any situation you're in to decide is it safe approach or is it dangerous, right? And then fight or flight, right? We're all familiar with this concept of fight or flight. It's when our brain tries to decide like, should I fight or should I run away? And our brain does this all the time. Now what's happening right now because of um, just the nature of the virus and the fact that there, most things are unknown. We don't know when things will change. We don't, things are changing all the time. There's so much uncertainty. Our brain is still trying to figure out what is safe, how to keep us safe, but it doesn't know how to do it because by nature, things are so uncertain. And so the brain doesn't give up, right? Our brain can be a good ally. It tries harder and harder and harder. And that harder and harder and harder, the way it does that is it releases stress hormone. And so if you are feeling exceptionally overwhelmed and stressed or even physically exhausted, I just wanted to give you some context that uncertainty has a lot to do with it. Um, and physical exhaustion, I don't know if any of you have been feeling um, recently or even the past couple months, like just physically exhausted. For me, it was really puzzling. I'm not on the road. I'm sleeping in my own bed. I'm not like a good hotel sleeper. So I'm like, I'm at home. I'm not flying. I'm in my own bed and I'm exhausted. And the reason is when we feel so much psychological stress and there's no outlet for it, well, our body takes it in. And so it disturbs our sleep. It makes it a sluggish. Um, one of the, I just want to give you just on this part, a, an analogy that I read in one of the research studies. It's just been helpful to me um, about uncertainty. So imagine um, you have a meeting you're going to and um, you're driving and there's no traffic. You left yourself plenty of time to get there. So you're not particularly stressed about making the meeting. You know you'll make it safe. Imagine you get on the highway and there is bumper to bumper traffic and there's a huge accident up ahead. So of course you're stressed because you realize you're not gonna make the meeting, but you know you're not gonna make it. You know nothing, there's nothing you can do. You are stressed, the brain says danger, but it turns out the hardest thing for your brain is if you get on the highway, Sometimes there's no traffic and then all of a sudden there's traffic and then it eases up again. Like I see you nodding. We've all been there. And then there's more tra and you don't know. The brain can't figure out if you're going to make the meeting or not. That causes us the most stress, it turns out. And so right now, if you think about it, we're all in that changing, right? Some days things feel hopeful, then difficult things happen. Again, we're not sure. And so there's just this constant uncertainty. And this is why I want to start by talking about the skill of acceptance, because um, the skill of acceptance allows us or gives us the ability to make choices about um, what we can control and investing our energy there and what we cannot control and not wasting our precious emotional and mental energy on that because of all the stress we're feeling and anxiety of all the uncertainty we don't have a ton of extra energy to waste. You know, we all start our days um, kind of like a, an analogy, if you think of a reservoir of water. So we all start the day with a certain amount of emotional, mental, and physical energy. It is not unlimited. As we go through the day, we use that energy. And so particularly when we're going through something as challenging as right now, our reservoir is not full to begin with. All of the stress and anxiety and challenges make it that our reservoir is not full. So we really have to be intentional about how we spend our emotional energy. And that's why I want to start with acceptance. So um, let's just start by defining what it is. What is acceptance? Um, 
uh, I used to hate this word, I have to tell you. I used to hear this word, and I don't know if you know my background, but I grew up in Russia. I came to the US as a refugee with my parents when I was a teenager. Um, it was a really hard journey. We lived in refugee camps on the way here. Um, we began our American dream and the projects outside of Detroit on welfare and food stamps. So it was a really um, hard experience and it kind of made me a fighter, you know, like I'm an immigrant, I've been an entrepreneur my whole life. And so the word acceptance felt very like, woohoo, like whatever happens, happens, just like sit back. And that was very passive. Well, mostly because I misunderstood what it meant. Acceptance is the skill of learning to look at how things are and how you feel with clarity instead of judgment and then using that as your starting point to decide how to move forward and i'm going to unpack both of those so what does it mean to look at things with clarity instead of judgment well my shorthand for you is clarity is about the facts and judgment um the shorthand for judgment is the word should so the minute you're in the should you're in judgment right this person is not how they should be. I am not how I should be. This is not going how it should be. And don't get me wrong, there's so much that is going on in our world right now is not how it should be. But getting stuck in ruminating on the fact that it's not how it should be mm -hmm. doesn't help change anything. The only thing that we get when we get stuck in the should, in the judgment, is we waste emotional and mental energy. That's the yeah. only outcome. And so, um, the other part of judgment is also um, like uh, creating dramatic stories in our brains. You know, um, uh, it's so easy right now to get lost in ruminating on in negative thinking, right? There's so many things that are wrong in our world. But again, getting stuck in those dramatic stories doesn't actually help us move forward and doesn't change anything. And so the first part of acceptance is really looking at whatever situation you're in and saying, well, what are the facts that I know to be true versus what is the story my brain has made up or what is the should that I'm stuck in? And that includes your feelings. So acknowledging uh, the situation with acceptance also means practicing acceptance towards your feelings, including the difficult ones. And um, this is also something when I say this, you know, uh, people get surprised sometimes, but true emotional health and happiness has nothing to do with feeling good all the time. It's all about learning how to embrace the full range of the human emotions that you feel, including the difficult ones. And so a really important part of acceptance is to learn how to accept our own difficult feelings, which is not fun and it is not easy. And most of us, our instinct when we feel a difficult emotion, our instinct is to run away. And we all have our favorite coping mechanisms, okay? Just think about yours. And I just have to share mine because, you know, we have to practice open acceptance. So uh, think about how you try not to feel feelings. Um, for me, a uh, couple favorites. So any show on Netflix with like the words FBI, CIA, Secret Service, Air Force One, like I just, I don't know, they just zen me out. So I'm like, okay, all of that. Currently binging MI5, which is a British show on crime. So good. Okay, other things, uh, too much red wine, way too much chocolate. Um, or how about this? We all have this favorite method. Okay, the endless scrolling of social media, here I come, right? So all of those things we all, and you all have your own coping mechanisms because it's not fun to feel a difficult feeling. It doesn't feel good. But here's the thing, research shows that when you fully accept and acknowledge a difficult emotion like fear, sadness, regret, guilt, you get through it in a shorter amount of time and with less intensity. And that is because you are not wasting your precious emotional energy fighting with it. It takes energy to fight with our feelings. And you know, Carl Jung, who's a really famous psychologist, um, has a quote I love for this. He says, that which you resist persists. So if you're resisting feeling a feeling, just because it's unpleasant, it doesn't make it go anywhere. It just sits there and festers. And I think we all know this. And so a really powerful and important part of acceptance is to also accept our feelings and to do it, um, I use this analogy for myself, to do it as a kind witness instead of a harsh judge, right? So um, something like, um, so a lot of folks have been sharing with me that they're having a really hard time being motivated right now. And they say, but I love my job, but I can't get motivated. I can't get anything done. And I should, I should be motivated. So. Well, it's a difficult feeling to not feel motivated about something you love, right? So kind witness would say, uh, I'm not feeling motivated. Okay, 
a harsh judge would say, I can't believe I'm not motivated. I should be more motivated. I love my job. How come I'm not more motivated, right? And so the practice of accepting our difficult feelings is to do it with as a witness, as a kind witness would do it. And one of the reasons that is so important um, is when we're able to know with clarity how we're feeling and how things are, that actually puts us in the driver's seat to figure out, okay, this is how I feel. This is what the situation is. This is how other people in the situation feel with clarity. Given how this is, what is one thing that I can do to honor this moment, to honor myself, to honor others involved? And that actually puts us in the driver's seat. We get to choose. And notice I didn't say, how do I fix everything for everyone and make it perfect? Okay, I didn't say that. I said, what is one thing I can do? Because taking one small step is really powerful. Our brain loves progress loves when we just get one small thing done our brain gets really um, motivated and it looks for other steps we can do to help us work through the situation and so the second the second part of acceptance right the first part is look at how things are and how you feel with clarity instead of judgment and the second part is identify one thing that you could do to honor this moment to honor the situation to honor yourself to honor people involved and I have to tell you, this is not a simple practice. I just want to um, be really open about that. Our, our ego would rather stay in the should. It would rather get angry at ourselves, at others. It would rather talk about all the things and how they should not be. You know, our egos are fantastic at helping us suffer. In fact, in my book, I actually talk about this um, concept of the valley of suffering. The valley of suffering is the distance between how something is and how we have decided it should be. In between is the valley of suffering. It's entirely of our own creation, right? Because we've now created this idea of how we should feel, how others should be, and we help ourselves suffer. And the practice of acceptance helps us to not get stuck. It actually helps us to see things clearly. Um, I wanna actually, uh, as we're talking about acceptance, I wanna take a moment to talk about um, how practicing acceptance and, uh, can be so powerful in helping all of us to be meaningful sources of support to our Black colleagues and our friends and our family members who are struggling with so much pain and, and loss and trauma right now from everything going on. Um, you know, one of, um, and we have a link, by the way, I did a webinar about this yesterday um, for lots and lots of folks, this whole topic of becoming a better emotional ally. And I know we'll, we can share a link for, uh, to their recording for anyone interested, because um, we go pretty deep into this. But uh, what often stops us from taking action, and I can speak to this, actually, I should speak to this very personally. Uh, this weekend, um, I had this moment of, I felt on the edge of hopelessness, like for the first time since everything began, I just became completely overwhelmed with all the pain that I could feel around me and for my black friends and people that I knew. I just, it was too much. And I have to tell you, my first instinct was to like close up and get really small because I had all this fear of, well, as a white woman, like, what can I do that's meaningful? Or what if I say the wrong thing? Or what if I offend someone? And that fear can be really paralyzing. And our fear can actually get in the way of us taking action, of us becoming those meaningful allies um, for others. And so this practice of accepting what we feel of acknowledging it with clarity instead of judgment, instead of how dare I feel this way or I'm a horrible person because I feel this way, it's really powerful because it's one of the skills we need to work through that fear, to work through that guilt and to move forward, right? So my practice of acceptance this weekend was, um, okay, I, I feel a lot of fear that I'm not gonna do enough, that something that I do will offend someone. Um, I have a lot of guilt. Uh, because I don't know if I'm doing enough. I have a lot of guilt that I've not educated myself on racism enough. Um, okay, that's how I feel. What is one thing I can do to help me move through that? And one thing that um, my answer was as well, I can connect to my bigger why, which is um, your sense of purpose, your sense of meaning. And my bigger why is I want to help I want to become a better emotional ally for my black friends and family. And I want to help all the people I work with do the same. And when you practice acceptance instead of self-flagellation or judgment and getting stuck there, 
and then you connect to your bigger why, it actually helps us to work through that fear and the guilt. And then we can show up. We can show up for our colleagues. We can show up for our friends. So this is also just a really, really powerful practice um, to help us move through a lot of those inner blockers that get in our way of truly showing up as our best selves for all the people that we care about. So it's not just um, a practice that serves us. It's a, it's a way for us to be better at serving others. Um, one are there a couple other things I want to say about acceptance. Um, you know, a lot of questions. Uh, so since the pandemic started, I, I've lost count at this point, Debbie keeps count, but since the pandemic started, I think we've done something like 60 sessions like this for both companies and teams and pro bono for folks like you for the medical community. Um, and one of the questions that's come up probably in every single one is, how can I help my family members, my colleagues, uh, my friends who are really having a hard time in this crisis? And my answer is always acceptance. You know, one of the things that, one of the uh, most powerful and difficult lessons I've learned on my journey is um, I used to be a um, committed fixer, okay? If anyone shared with me any problem they have, I was like, oh, I'm gonna help you fix it. Any other fixers? In the audience raised it. Oh, yeah, okay. So I think everyone's hand is up, right? And here's the thing we do it from love. It's from love. It's from like, especially if any, like many of us, I think our parents here, like if your kid is struggling, what's the first thing we want to do? We want to help them feel better. We want to cheer them up because we love them so much. And one of the most powerful lessons that I have learned is actually when someone is having a hard time, the biggest gift that we can give them is acceptance is our wholehearted acceptance and validation of their feelings. Not jumping into the fixing, not jumping into the cheering up, which is hard, but to just show up with our open heart, with ourselves fully present and fully accept how they're feeling and validate how they're feeling. Validating does not mean you agree. Validating means I hear you, I understand how you feel. And again, I think it is such an important and powerful skill always, but especially right now, as so many of our Black friends and community members and colleagues are struggling with so much, to practice full unconditional acceptance of their feelings, which also means when we talk to them, we don't have our own agenda, we don't bring our own guilt and stories, and we don't have any particular expectation of how the person might be feeling. You know, a, a story I've been sharing when I've been talking about this is, um, so I have a friend, her name is Michelle, she's a very close friend of mine, and um, she's black. And so this weekend I called to just check in on her. And, you know, I, I kind of had like a preconceived idea that she would want to talk to me about all the difficult feelings she had. And I called her up and I said, how are you? And she said, oh my God, girl, I found this awesome show on Netflix. You have to watch it. It's called Sweet Magnolias. And I love this new wine that I got. And then we were talking about the Netflix shows and I didn't like the wine that she had. And I had this idea of what she needed, but actually she just needed some chit chat. She needed some girl time, right? And I, it was a powerful lesson to just show up to every interaction and every moment without expectations, with just every moment as a new moment, every interaction we have with a person to, to look at them without preconceived notions, without our own agenda and without, oh, this person must feel a certain way. And that's such a powerful practice of acceptance, which really, um, it, it's so, when we are, when any of us are struggling, it is so powerful to feel accepted as we are, instead of feeling like we have to feel better. And I think we all know that within ourselves, right? Like when you're having a hard time, it doesn't feel good if someone's like, oh, come on, it's not a big deal. Or like, oh, come on, it'll get better. Or like, oh, cheer up. We need to have that safety to feel what we feel. And that actually, so when you can show up to someone who's struggling with your full acceptance, you are helping them to process their feelings, to get present with their feelings, and actually to move through them with a little more ease. And so this practice of acceptance is so powerful for us, and it's a powerful thing for us to practice to not get stuck in our fear. And it's so powerful to practice towards others who are struggling because it validates their feelings and it doesn't add, 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 um, stuff that they don't want to deal with. Um, so that's acceptance. Um, again, if you folks have questions, we are going to do questions. I just I want to talk about self-compassion. And then um, I know there's always great questions. So I always want to take time. So that's what I'm doing. I'm checking my time.
where did my time go? There we go. Oh, awesome. And um, just so everyone can look in chat, uh, Debbie is posting a couple links. Um, Debbie, do you want to actually say what those links are? And then I'll keep going. Yes, the first link that I posted is the webinar that Natalie mentioned that we did yesterday on becoming an emotional ally and um, has um, a, uh, goes further with the, some of the stuff that she just talked about. And then also we have a resource page um, that has virtual resources um, for you and from anyone in your sphere, please share um, widely and broadly. There's videos, handouts, um, and other resources there for you and your emotional health during this challenging time. And we've got some other links that we're gonna post um, at the end as well. And I'll, I'll repost these um, with those all together. Um, and Thank I'm, you, I'm sure they'll be sent out too. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, yes, and by the way, on the resource page, there's a handout um, that you can all print that includes one minute ways to practice acceptance and some of the other skills. So it's a, it's a handy tool. Um, so I want to talk about self-compassion as another really important, essential skill for all of us to practice now. And they are connected. Acceptance and self-compassion are connected. Um, uh, again, one of the things I've been hearing so much from folks, um, I mentioned it um, at the beginning, is, you know, I'm, I don't know what's going on. I'm not getting enough done. I'm not as motivated. I'm not helping as many people as I want. Um, you know, I thought since during this virus, I'm home, I would like redecorate all my closets um, or start a new workout regimen. And I'm just like being a lazy sloth. And uh, I see a lot of you nodding because I think this, this is something many of us have done. Um, we, I don't know why, I really don't know why we set these impossible standards for ourselves that we don't have for others, but we do. And so I, I think, Self-compassion is such an important skill to talk about in, in this context. And before I do, I want to give you um, how, an analogy that I've been using for kind of what we're all going through. So um, uh, I think of us being in a storm. And um, sometimes the storm gets really violent. Sometimes it's a little calmer. But we're in a storm. And the thing is, when you're going through a storm, your job is to get to the other side. Your job is to make it through. When you're in a storm, your job is not to learn five new languages, okay? When you're going through the storm, your job is not to learn 17 new skills and have a new workout regimen and redecorate your closets and learn all kinds of new recipes for your family. No, your job is just to make it through and to preserve and fuel yourself as much as possible with good energy and resilience so you can make it through. And one of the most powerful ways that I know how to do this is with self-compassion. So, um, you know, it's interesting. Uh, so the way that I define self-compassion, I start with a definition. So the skill of self-compassion is treating yourself as you would a friend. It's about creating a kinder friendship with yourself. And um, I want to give you a question to think about. Don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to answer this in any way. But I want you to answer this question. What kind of relationship do you have with yourself? Just think about it for a moment. First, actually, I'd love this next question. I'd love just a show of hands. How many of you have actively thought about this often? Okay, so one or two people. And this is something I see everywhere. I'll tell you, I'm 44 years old. For most of my life, this would have been a ridiculous idea. Like, what kind of question is this? What do you mean what kind of relationship I have with myself? My focus was, I want to be a great mom. I want to be a great leader for my team. I want to be a great daughter, a great wife, a great friend. Like, I really thought of myself as this, like, other focused being. So what, what did my relationship have to do with myself? And the way that I live my life, for most of my life, is as a martyr, right? So I neglected my well-being. I neglected my emotions. I never took breaks. I never really treated myself nicely, but I thought, well, nobody cares about that as long as I'm doing wonderful things as a mom or doing wonderful things with my team. Well, um, there, there's so much false to that. So first of all, um, if you are feeling overwhelmed, if you are exhausted, if you are being unkind to yourself and you think that people around you don't feel it, that's a lie you're telling yourself. And that's a lie I was telling myself. So, you know, I'd stand there on Sunday nights 
and I, you know, I've always worked as I've been a mom, so it's always a juggle. So I'd stand there on Sunday nights and I'd make these like homemade, beautiful Mia meals for my daughter Mia. And I felt so good, like I'd be there at two in the morning, exhausted, like falling over. But I derived the sick, like sick, like feeling of satisfaction of like being the smarter. Like I am so tired, but look what I, you know, she's gonna have these great meals. And I completely neglected to acknowledge that I served her these great meals with a healthy side of stress, exhaustion, snappy mom. Um, I didn't want to acknowledge that because, you know, this idea, um, the smarter idea that many of us do with our families or with our colleagues, with our teams, it's, it's a bit of an ego trap. We have to recognize it. And, you know, I learned it from the women in my family. We all learn it from somewhere. Um, you know, there's a... There's a thing, there's a joke they say about Russians that Russians are good at three things. Suffering, making others suffer, and complaining about suffering. Okay, and it's only funny if you like haven't met the women in my family because this is where I disappoint you because I'm not in first place. My grandma who passed away a couple of years ago at the age of 87 was the best sufferer in the family. My mom holds second place, I do hold third. I, I am up there on the pedestal, but you know, like I grew up and my grandma, um, you know, in Russia, we, it was really hard to get food, like basics. So I don't know how she did this, but she would make these amazing feasts. But part of her giving us this food was for her to tell us how much she suffered making it. So it'd be like, oh my God, I almost had a heart attack and the kitchen is so small and these tomatoes were horrible. And by the way, the slam is not even as good as last week. And then we as a family, the way that we showed our appreciation was to suffer with her. So we would be like, yes, Babushka, you look really horrible. You like aged 27 years while making the slam. And you're right, the slam is not as good as last time. And so there was like, what I learned is you express love by suffering. And I definitely brought that into my, I love that everyone is nodding. Yes, I think many of us learn these things from our families. Um, and then we try really, really hard to not pass them on to our kids and we probably do. Um, and here comes my child with a charge cord from my computer. <laughs> Say hello. Hello. This is my this is my child to whom I'm trying to not pass on something. <laughs> Thank you, my love. Thank you. I just looked at my computer and I don't know what's going on, but I realized we might run out of juice. So uh, it's wonderful. See, upside of a lockdown, I can text my almost 16 year old and be like, "Yo, get my cord." Excuse me for a minute. Okay, practicing full acceptance, you guys, you see? Should have been ready. Oh, uh-uh, oh, no, see? So my brain just went, oh my God, you should have had it plugged in. That's what my brain went. So instead, let's do this together. So instead, how do we do acceptance? Well, instead of the judgment, I say, um, I've been doing talks almost every, every day for 12 weeks, and today I forgot to plug in my computer. Okay, what's the next best thing I can do? Text my teenager. You see, avoiding suffering, and now I won't disappear. Um, so the reason I talk about suffering so much is we all have different ways that we um, create suffering or we learn suffering, and this is where self-compassion comes in. So acceptance, again, we have to recognize the feelings we have, and then when we ask ourselves, what's the next best thing I can do, often the answer is self-compassion. What is self-compassion? So I talked about self-compassion as a way to create a kinder friendship with yourself, but let's break it down. Um, Self-compassion means that we recognize that we are human beings and therefore we are imperfect. And if there's any recovering perfectionist here, hi, I'm Natalie, I'm a recovering perfectionist. I know this is hard news to take that you are not perfect. I know, I know, but it is true. We are human beings, we are imperfect, and most importantly, self-compassion means that we treat ourselves in a way that reduces suffering and struggle. Self-compassion doesn't mean, doesn't mean, oh, you never have to do anything, you never have to improve, just how you are is fine, not at all. It just says, I wanna treat myself as I would a friend. And none of us wanna cause our friends struggle and suffering as we cause ourselves. So let's go back to some of the examples I shared at the beginning, right? Um, I can't believe I'm not motivated to get my work done, or, oh my God, uh, I can't believe I haven't been exercising seven times a day, or, oh my God, I have not had a healthy meal in like five days, I'm a horrible person. We have a tendency to have such harsh judgment of ourselves. Well, 
I want to give you a couple ways to practice self-compassion when you get stuck in that self-created suffering. The first is I want to give you one of my favorite shorthands that I've come up during this crisis. And I came up with it a couple weeks ago when I um, cooked. So I, I, I do the cooking in our family. Mia and my husband, Avi, do the cleaning up. I hate dishes. And apparently, according to my husband, I cannot load a dishwasher correctly if my life depended on it. So I've, I've given that up. So I do the cooking. Apparently, I'm incapable of the dishwasher loading. So uh, it was one night and I had made this, we try to do meatless Mondays. So I made like this beautiful vegetarian dinner. I cook like these four things. And as I'm about to serve this beautiful homemade dinner to my husband and my daughter, I look down on the plate and uh, I say to them, oh my God, everything is kind of red orangish. I should have made something green. I really am not making you guys enough green. So think about this. I create, I, I cook this beautiful meal with love that was healthy, but I found a way to create suffering because I was like, aha, not enough greens on this plate. And I caught myself in that moment and I actually started to laugh at myself. And this is something I really recommend. Part of self-compassion and acceptance is to also approach ourselves with, take ourselves a little less seriously and be able to laugh at ourselves when we get ridiculous. So I started laughing in that moment because it was kind of a ridiculous statement. And then I had this realization, I was like, we are amidst a worldwide pandemic. And I was just criticizing myself for not making a green vegetarian dish alongside the four orange yellowish ones. And so I came up with the shorthand that I offered to you. You know, in college, you'd like get Chinese food and you take out the fortune cookie and you read the fortune and you add in bed to the end. Okay, so this is similar. So the next time you're like, I cannot believe I've not been exercising seven days in a row. I want you to add amidst a worldwide pandemic, or um, I cannot believe I've not reorganized all my closets amidst a worldwide pandemic, or how come I'm not motivated to get more done amidst a worldwide pandemic? Try this. I have taught this now to thousands of people, and I still hear from people every day who tell me like, oh my God, I love that, because it makes you laugh, but it's this powerful reminder to treat yourself with kindness and awareness, right? We're not all sitting at home on vacation with plenty of time. We're at home trying to do work and juggle family and worry about our future. And so that's my first little practice for you, this little shorthand. But I want to give you a self-compassion practice, which has been, um, which has been one of probably one of the most life-changing for me in terms of my relationship with myself. And by the way, the way you treat others is rooted in the way that you treat yourself. And so if you kind of, if you heard a voice in your head where I'm talking about self-compassion, say like, oh, I don't deserve it, whatever, the critical voice, remind yourself that the way you treat others is deeply rooted in how you treat yourself. And if you want to be a compassionate person to others, which I think is probably true for every single person sitting here, you have to begin with yourself. So here's the practice. I call it three steps to kinder self-talk. The first step is to become aware of when you're talking to yourself in a harsh way. And we all have ways of doing this, whether it's criticizing ourselves, telling ourselves we're not enough, we're not good enough, right? One way I did it was how dare I not make a green vegetarian dish alongside four wonderful others. So your first step is to become aware. And I have to tell you, this is a really powerful step because for so many of us, that harsh way that we talk to ourselves is on autopilot. Like when I began to practice this, I was shocked at how I talked to myself. It was awful. I would never talk that way to a stranger, not to mention someone I cared about. So that's your first step is just to practice awareness of how do you talk to yourself? What are the words? What is the tone? When you become aware that you're being harsh towards yourself, I want you, the second step is I want you to pause. And I want you in that pause to feel grateful that you noticed because there's so much power to just becoming aware. And the third step, this is your shift. So your third step is I want you to imagine that you're talking to someone you really love. So I always think of my daughter Mia for this. She knows who you just met. She knows I used her for this practice. Think of a loved one of just someone who you really love. And I want you to imagine you're talking to them. And I want you to rephrase what you just said to yourself in a harsh way as if you're saying it to them and actually rephrase it. And it is so powerful. I cannot tell you. I remember one of the first times I did this and I said something harsh to myself and I was like, okay, pretend I'm talking to Mia. And I was like, oh my God, I would never say this to her. I would say it totally differently. And so 
practicing this regularly, and again, I hope you've noticed I call these skills and then I give you practices because these are skills. We're not magically born knowing how to do them. We have to practice and practicing means we're not gonna get it perfect all the time. There are days where I criticize myself. There are days when I am nice, not nice towards myself. I am not perfect, but it's a skill. So all you need to do is keep practicing. And so those are your three steps to kinder self-talk. One, become aware of when you're being harsh towards yourself. Two, pause and be grateful that you noticed. And three, imagine you're talking to someone you really love and care about and then rephrase what you just said to yourself as if you're saying it to them. And keep practicing, keep doing this. The thing that I found uh, when I made up this practice for myself is the first couple times I did it, I learned so much, my awareness became better. And then the more I practiced, the easier it became for me to not be as harsh towards myself to begin with, because I really became committed to um, creating a kind of friendship with myself. And one of the reasons, as I mentioned, I realized that the more compassionate I became towards myself, the kinder and more compassionate I was to everyone around me. And that's a beautiful, beautiful incentive. So those are the skills and the practices. Um, again, uh, Debbie's going to repost the links, but on the resource page, there's a handout with some more practices and it's all accessible for free. And there's lots and lots of articles and blog posts and videos. Um, including on my YouTube channel that goes into other acceptance and self-compassion practices. Please feel free to share with anyone. We're all in this together. And um, yeah, I think it's time to take some questions because I could just, I think you can tell, I could just keep going. I just want to give you all the things. So Debbie, take it away with some questions. I take a sip of water. Awesome. Um, we've got some, we've got definitely got some questions. We've got three or four questions already, um, and you all can send questions to me um, in chat, either to everyone or to me directly. Um, okay, so Natalie, um, because so many people on the call, oh, I'm sorry, uh, chat just jumped down, so let me just get back to this question. Okay, so because so many people on the call work with children, um, what are some things that team can do to help them manage through change? So the yeah. team on the call who works with kids help them. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, the first thing I'll say is something that I have learned just um, from my experience is children as young as seven or eight, if you just simplify the words a little bit, they are really open to hearing about the practices I've shared. They understand them, they can practice them. Um, I've done a lot, a lot of talks to teenagers. My book actually is dedicated to my daughter, Mia, who was 13 when I wrote it. Um, and I know a lot, a lot of, oh, there, Debbie is my biggest, my biggest um, fan. She's always got the book. Yeah, the book is now out on paperback, so you can get a hardcover or paperback. Natalie, I was, I was, Natalie, I was using it as my wrist support with my computer to like lift my wrist up. So it was just right here. Fantastic. I love it. Um, and by the way, the book has 37 different one minute practices, including many <laughs> acceptance and self compassion. So, um, so one is I encourage you to take these practices and just simplify the language a little bit and bring them to the kids. I think the other one that's really uh, well, I want to say two things. Um, the part about validating their feelings as part of practicing acceptance and not asking them to shift is incredibly powerful. Um, you know, uh, we've been home for three months. Mia missed three months of sophomore year. It's not fun. She hasn't seen her friends. It's hard. And something that I've really, really tried to do is honor her feelings by validating them and not telling her to change them. And Debbie, if you would actually post the Washington Post article, so me and I actually wrote an, an op-ed for the Washington Post about with some tips for how to help kids get through this crisis. I interviewed her for it. So I think you'll also, Debbie, just put it in chat. You may find some helpful advice from her. Um, I think the other thing that is really helpful for um, kids is to manage some of the uncertainty. And by the way, it's the same advice I give to leaders for teams and parents with kids. So what's hard for the brain is when our brain gets starts to just think of like, oh my God, big, long time, what is going to happen? So bring it down, move the goalpost closer. So focus on what, it, what can you do today? What can we do tomorrow? What can we do this week? So shrink the time. And it's really helpful, um, even with Mia, who, you know, is almost 16. So only a couple more years, I get to call her a kid. 
I'm not sure she likes that, but um, even with her, what's really helpful is when I find her getting like, oh my God, mom, but what if we don't go back to school? What if there's another lockdown? Like the, it runs away, it becomes really debilitating just to bring it back and say, well, what do we know right now? Right now, actually, we don't know anything. We're probably, you know, right now, let's think about the couple things that we can do this week, right? To stay productive, to stay motivated. So shrinking the timeline is helpful. And the final thing is gratitude. You know, you guys have already, um, read about my gratitude practice. I think it is incredibly powerful for kids to get rooted every day and get centered in, can you uh, write or share with a friend one or two small things you appreciate? Because when we, and it's especially powerful in the morning, um, it's kind of, I call gratitude a um, primer for the brain. If we begin our day by focusing on what is good, what is okay, it helps us to have more resilience throughout the day. And they've done a lot of research with kids. When the kids practice gratitude first thing in the morning, they're more motivated, their behavior is calmer, they actually experience less anxiety. Okay, Natalie, so after you kindly realize that you do something that you need to change, what's the best way to move forward with taking steps towards change? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and I just want to say those two are related. So um, this is why acceptance is so powerful. So when we're actually able to witness um, how things are with clarity, part of that clarity becomes, oh, well, it's obvious to me the steps I can take, right? The hard thing about being stuck in judgment or in suffering is it actually clouds our brain. It clouds our ability to know how to move forward. Um, you know, I just it just occurred to me to share the story because I think it's a great answer. Um, remember uh, Captain uh, uh, Sullenberger uh, who landed the plane on the Hudson, the great movie Sully, I think most of us have seen. If you haven't, totally recommend it, um, right? He landed the plane on the Hudson River in New York City. The first time such a, a landing was attempted, he saved 150 passengers and crew. And a couple days after it happened, a couple weeks probably, I heard an interview with him. And the interviewer asked him, how, like, how did you know what to do? You don't train for a river landing. Like, it's not part of pilot's training. And his answer, he didn't never use the word acceptance, but I was listening and, like, I had a smile ear to ear because actually what he practiced was acceptance. What he said was, two things helped me. The first was, I saw what happened. So the birds flew into both engines of the plane, and he saw it happen. And he said, so I knew why I was losing engines. I didn't waste any time thinking, what did I do? What could I have done differently? Like, I didn't waste any time on that because I saw what happened. He said, the second thing that was helpful is I knew I had, I think it was 260 seconds to get the plane safely on the ground. So I knew I had no time to wish I wasn't in the situation. I had no time to be like, this is not how it should be. I just started to go down my checklist of like, here's what's possible. Turn back, not enough time. New Jersey, not enough time. Emergency landing, not enough time. Okay, the river. And I think it's such a powerful example of the power of acceptance because that's what he practiced, right? The first is he witnessed the situation with clarity instead of judgment. He said, I've lost both of my engines and I have 200 plus seconds to get the plane on the ground. He didn't waste any time in, this is not how it should be. Oh my God, I don't want to be in this situation. He didn't waste any time on that. And not doing that then gave him the the direction to say, okay, what is the next best thing I can do? The next best thing he could do was to just go through the checklist and then they figured out what to do. And that's the practice, right? So acknowledging how things are and how you feel always gives us the guidance on what to do. So the first step is really guides you to action because then when you ask yourself this question, I think the question is really important. The question is not, again, how do I change and, and make everything okay? The question is, what is one thing I can do given how things are? And I, I know all of you can identify one thing and then you do that thing and you come up with more, but it's really that first step that guides the second, that guides the action. Uh, okay, two more questions and I'm gonna give you the long one first or the short one first? Long. Okay. As we all have different, so this one is about, uh, or the, the answer is going to be around emotional allyship. Uh, the question is, as we all have different feelings or perspectives about the most recent situation with riots and protests, how do we approach each other as a team, as a company, and others 
with compassion while not feeling that you are being disingenuous or disloyal to your own feelings? It's a really, really beautiful question to whoever asked it. Thank you. I think it's a really powerful question. And we've been talking a lot about this, as I mentioned, in all the sessions we've been doing this week. Um, the answer is kind of really simple. The answer is you have to start from a really authentic place within yourself. That's the place you have to start. And so centering in that and being really honest with yourself in that is the first most important step. You know, someone asked the question, I think it was in yesterday's webinar, um, I mentioned about checking in on friends um, who are either protesting or maybe you're black friends. And she said, well, I don't know, I have this friend, but I haven't really talked to her in a while. Should I check in on her? And I said, do you really care? That's your decision point. If you really care, if you truly care, then check in. If you don't, don't fake it because we are all human beings and we all sense each other's emotions. So if you're not coming from a really authentic, genuine place, you're not truly bringing compassion to others. And so I really encourage you to practice acceptance of, well, how am I really feeling? And then again, um, I think it's wonderful that we wanna be compassionate, but just think about like, what is your bigger why? Like, what is it that you wanna do? How are you trying to show up to someone? Because Look, I have a lot of people in my family who um, have very different views on the world. Oh, and not just politically, just in every different way. I'm a very spiritual person that is not the kind, you know, my family is not. But you can be compassionate towards someone without having to agree with them. Because compassion is not about political beliefs or spiritual beliefs or anything else. Compassion is simply saying, I recognize you are a human being and you have something you are struggling with. And I just want to approach you in a way to reduce some of that struggle. That's it. That's compassion. It doesn't say that I agree with your opinions. It doesn't say that let's hash out our opinions. And again, I ask you to start from a place of why do you, what is meaningful to you about approaching this person? Why? And if the answer is because I care about them, because I want to help them find a little bit more ease or, um, I, I, I want them to feel safe expressing how they are, then that's your guide. And if the answer is, this doesn't feel true to me, then no action you take will be meaningful and it's better to not. And so that's your practice. That's your practice of being really uh, accepting of your own emotions and really honest with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. You know, I want to, but before I ask this last question, I want to acknowledge that I, I noticed that there are um, at least several Black people on the call. And I'm so grateful that Natalie and I, that you've given us the opportunity to give you support today and that you showed up today. Um, you know, we know and, and, uh, and want to acknowledge that, that you're not okay and that you're exhausted. And the fact that you're here today um, means a lot to us. So thank you. Thank you for being here today and, and making your emotional health a priority. Um, so the last question, Natalie, um, is about uh, making emotional health a priority. The question uh, uh, that, that you asked um, us to ask ourselves about relationship with self, what books or podcasts would you recommend? Um, this person is reading, oh, it's Erin. She sent it to everyone. Erin is um, reading The Untethered Soul, and she loves it, but would love to know of others. Uh, I love that you're reading that book. I often say that I recommend Untethered Soul um, and The Surrender Experiment, which are both by Michael Singer. I recommend them probably more than my own book. Um, I've never met Michael Singer, but I consider him one of my teachers. Um, so those are wonderful. So again, the author's name is Michael Singer. If you just look him up, he's got these two incredibly helpful books. Um, I do have to tell you that I think Happier Now, my book, um, all the things I've talked about, there's a lot on them. And the book is, uh, the first half is my story of how I went from a Soviet refugee to every height you can imagine of career success to a full crash, burn, and breakdown and how I found my way out. And then the second part of the book are the five skills and practices for each one. So it's both a story and a how-to. So I do highly recommend it. I'm very proud of it. Um, let's see, one other book. 
oh, let's just practice what we preach. So behind me, I don't know if you can see this little bookshelf. I call this my sacred bookshelf. So um, at the, on the top of it are kind of the books that I read and reread and reread most often. Untethered Soul is there. So let's just practice what we preach and see what's here. Oh, okay. Oh, I'll give you two. I'm going to give you two more. So, oh, this is shiny. So this book, Polishing the Mirror by Ram Das. Um, is incredible. Uh, I've probably given this as a gift more than I've given Happier Now, and I can tell you I've given out probably 5,000 copies of Happier Now, so it says a lot. Um, it's, uh, it's incredibly powerful, and I can't believe I share the same publisher with Ram Das. We don't have time for me to tell you about Ram Das, but trust me, if you're interested in anything I've talked about, you want to buy this book. And then the second one is this little, little tiny book that's, um, I love so much. It's by Pema Chodron. I'm gonna put her name in chat because it's kind of hard to remember. And it's called Fail, Fail Again, Fail Better. And it's just this incredible book about um, compassion and self-compassion and um, some of the traps we get into and how to move through them. So they're, they're both here. Let me just put Pema's name in here. Got it, Natalie. Okay, wonderful. Um, oh, there you go. Yeah, so um, Michael Singer's books, Happier Now. Polishing the Mirror by Ram Dass, and you get this very shiny uh, book. And uh, Fail, Fail Again, and Fail Better by Pema Chodron are great, 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 great places to start. So I, I always say, I don't know where the time goes. I really don't. Um, I feel like we've been here for five minutes, but apparently we've been here for a whole hour. Um, so I just want to end with gratitude um, because uh, it's this work, doing this work, being able to share these practices, these skills, my journey with you. Um, this is the way that I can be of help. This is the way I can be of service during this challenging time. And that is my lifeline. This is what is getting me through this time. So I'm so grateful for your warmth and your presence and your openness. And thank you so much for turning on your cameras. I'm so grateful that I got to talk to humans and not myself or my screen. Um, and most of all, as Debbie said, I'm just grateful you took this time for yourself. Please share this recording with all of your colleagues. Please share any of the resources on the resource page as openly and widely. It is all there for you. Um, and the last thing I just want to leave you with is that you can give what you don't have. You know, um, it's how I end every single talk. Because for me, that's a really powerful reminder to keep practicing these skills. You know, it can be easy to make our self-care, our well-being. It can be really easy for it to like slide to the bottom of the list. Um, it can be easy right now to feel that's an indulgence um, or, oh, I feel so selfish. But the truth truly is that you cannot give what you don't have. If you are depleted, if you are exhausted, if you are punishing yourself, you cannot show up fully for others. And so your well-being and your emotional health is not an option. It's not a luxury. It is your responsibility so that you can get through the storm and so you can be a meaningful source of support from, for other people that you care about and work with to help them get through the storm. So you can give what you don't have. Just remember that whenever you want to put yourself at the bottom of your list. So thank you all so, so much. Um, there's lots of ways to stay in touch, but the best way is if you go to happier.com and subscribe to the email, we send it every Tuesday. I write everyone myself, always. Um, there's never spam. There's just more of this. Um, and I know Debbie posted some other links. So thank you all so, so much. Um, I always give virtual hug at the end, virtual hug, virtual Yay. hug, all the way from Yay. Yay. Natalie, thank you so I love much it. for your time today. It's really been a gift and really appreciate your magnetic energy and um, just all of your positive words of wisdom and uh, practices that everybody could take um, forward and use. So thank you. Really appreciate your time. Thank you beautiful. so much, everyone. And I know, I think someone, someone sent me a private chat. The art behind me is my art. I started painting <laughs> a few years ago, so someone asked. So I try to give you guys as much joy as I can with the art and with the yellow because we all need it. So thank you all so, so much. Thank, thank you for you. Have a great day. Thank Bye. you.